Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight at the World Affairs Council event, uh, World Affairs Council of New Hampshire event, our second in the T. William and Patricia Ayers Global Tipping Points series. Mihina, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback, I think, from your computer. Um, <laughs> Uh, so thank you all uh, for joining us here for the, the second in our T. William and Global uh, T. William and Patricia Ayers Global Tipping Points event on immigration policy and the stories behind it. I'll get to introducing our, our two panelists here for tonight, but tonight we'll be focusing on refugees and the refugee policy uh, and, and hearing some stories about people who have gone through that that form of immigration. Um, we are here as a nonpartisan organization. We look to share stories to help people better understand what's going on around the world, and therefore we do not take any stances on politics, parties, policies, or candidates. Uh, we view ourselves as the platform for discussions, and we hope that you take what you hear tonight, uh, think about it, and spread it amongst your networks uh, in ways that you feel uh, is, is valuable. Uh, we are looking at these programs, as all of our programs, as the start of a conversation, not the end of it. Obviously, we can only get through so much in an hour, um, and we hope that you continue to, to talk and think about these issues uh, once you leave here tonight. We are also a non profit membership organization and cannot continue any of these programs without the generous support of our members, donors, sponsors, and supporters. Uh, we have a couple of representatives here tonight of our uh, series sponsors, uh, Ful New Hampshire Fulbright, New Hampshire chapter of the Fulbright Association and Building Community in New Hampshire. Uh, thank you both for the, the great support you've provided to help make these programs possible. Thank you to all of the members and board members here in the room and watching online for your generous support, and to the donors uh, who, who have also helped make our work possible. Uh, Southern New Hampshire University is our mission partner and helps uh, make all of this, including giving us a uh, wonderful space to ensure that we can have these conversations. Um, so thank you to everyone who, who has made this evening possible. Uh, if you are not yet a member and would be interested in learning more, please talk to myself, Maheen, or Larry on your way out. Happy to, to talk to you more about ways that in which you can get involved with our organization from attending events, meeting international visitors, uh, and listening to our Global in the Granite State podcast. Um, so I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Bill DeVries here, the president of the New Hampshire chapter of the Fulbright Association and one of our great sponsors for a, a few quick remarks. Hi, I'd also like to welcome you here. As he said, I'm Bill DeVries, president of the New Hampshire chapter of the Fulbright Association. The Fulbright Association is a nonprofit, uh, private organization that the purpose of which is to support the Fulbright program. And the Fulbright program is the uh, scholarly exchange program sponsored by the U.S. State Department. Um, it's a <clears throat> joint program that is, it has um, partnerships between the United States and uh, the local national governments in 160 different countries. The funding usually comes from both sides, uh, quite often with a 50-50 split uh, between the U.S. and uh, the foreign government. It's an exchange program, so there are Americans going abroad on the program, and there are foreigners coming here. There are, for instance, this year, uh, 16 uh, foreigners uh, studying in the U.S. under the auspices of Fulbright. Um, roughly split about half and half between uh, Durham, UNH, and uh, Dartmouth. One or two actually in, as teaching assistants uh, elsewhere in the state. There are, in fact, a lot of different uh, Fulbright uh, programs. Um, and, you know, we tend to think of this as aimed at students, so, you know, the traditional 18 to 21 or 24-year-olds, but it's not. Um, many of you could apply. 
If you've got special expertises that would be of interest to foreign countries, you could sign up, for instance, the Fulbright Specialist Program, where you get not necessarily a full year, but maybe a two-week or a six-week uh, stay abroad, where you can learn something from uh, them, and or they can learn something from you. So think about it. But in any case, I want to encourage you strongly to let your representatives know um, that the Fulbright Program is probably the most effective uh, diplomacy that the U.S. conducts. Uh, it brings people here to get to know us. It brings us abroad to get to know them. And in every case, that knowledge that usually, I think, I think overwhelmingly redounds to the favor and to the uh, better relations between each. So that's one of the reasons why we get involved with the World Affairs Council, because we think um, you have to know what's going on in order to see how best to pursue the goals we all have of peace and goodwill. Well, thank you, Bill. I appreciate your, uh, your organization's efforts to help globalize New Hampshire even further and uh, uh, your partnership with us as well. Um, all right, so I'm going to join our panelists here um, and do a quick introduction, but want to keep this part short uh, in order to maximize our time with our, our great panelists here. Um, so I'll start off uh, on the far left with uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Thielman. He's the president and CEO of the International Institute of New England, which works to help resettle uh, thousands, probably hundreds of thousands at this point over the years uh, of refugees in New England. Uh, in, uh, prior to that, he co-founded the uh, Cristo Rey Network of Schools, uh, which now serve over 13,000 low-income students in 24 states. Uh, he's spent time as a trial attorney, spent time in financial services, and uh, did some great volunteer work in Peru, as I understand it, as well. Um, so perhaps we can talk a little bit about your experiences uh, as, we, as we go through this. Um, but thank you so much, Jeff, for, for joining us and, and providing sort of the policy uh, viewpoint. Um, and then we also have uh, Vijay Bujal. All right, thank you. Uh, he is the Deputy Director of Building Community in New Hampshire. Uh, he came to the United States uh, from Bhutan in 2012 after 22 years in a refugee camp himself. Uh, has become uh, one of the, the shining stars of the refugee community here, uh, particularly the Bhutanese community. Uh, and I know Rick here, the, the executive director of Building Community in New Hampshire, is very happy to have you on staff. He, he is always talking you up and, uh, you know, when he retires, it, it, I think you're next up, so be ready. Um, but here tonight, we want to really talk about the, the policies of refugees, identify who refugees are. Uh, it is a term that I think is thrown about uh, whenever there's an uh, a, a immigration conversation or debate in a way that um, there is a very official meaning of refugee and we do not see refugees, official refugees, randomly showing up at the border uh, and you know, sneaking across as a lot of uh, people have claimed, we'll say. Um, so Jeff, can you just start off and, and tell us about what exactly is a refugee, what's the offic official designation, and how does someone achieve that status? Sure, thanks so much, and thanks for that lovely introduction. Now you did your research. Uh, so the, a refugee is someone who uh, has a well-founded fear of persecution in their homeland. They have fled their country of origin, they've gone to a different country, and they can't go home again because they're a member of a group, such as a religious group, an ethnic group, a political group, uh, or some other group that is persecuted by the government. So think of people that fled Syria, and went to Turkey uh, years ago and are still actually leaving and they went to Turkey and uh, they can't stay in Turkey, they can't go back home to Syria. Then they go through a, a process of uh, being determined as a refugee by the United Nations. There's about 26 or 27 million refugees around the world and uh, these are folks who have a well-founded fear of persecution, cannot go back to their homeland and they're designated in some cases for resettlement. The United States has had a resettlement, a refugee resettlement program, a formal program since 1980. 
refugees come here through a high, uh, through a lot of vetting. They're vetted by uh, several different government authorities, several different government agencies, and then finally they're given permission to come to the United States. That's a long process. We've resettled refugees here at the International Institute of New England who have been in refugee camps for a dozen or more years. We've resettled people that have been on a waiting list for two or three years to come to this country. So by the time they get here, they come uh, with a visa uh, stamped as a refugee. They have a year, a year after that, and they can get a green card. And then within five years, they could become uh, citizens of the United States. So that's the formal refugee resettlement program. Most people in the United, who come to the United States actually don't enter through that program. They enter through other programs. Great, thank you. And Vijay, can you just tell us a little bit about what your experience was like? Um, you know, I think a lot of people in New Hampshire may know about uh, the the Bhutanese community and, and your experiences. I know we've talked with a lot of people and, and done things with your community in the past. Uh, but can you talk just to your specific experience of um, what happened in Bhutan that uh, created this refugee crisis and how you experienced the process of being resettled to New Hampshire that clearly took quite a few years for you. Thank you, Dean. Um, actually, you know, he already mentioned, Jeff already mentioned about who the refugees are. So one of the refugees is right here. <laughs> so, um, I'm originally from Bhutan and a former refugee. Lived in a refugee camp for about more than two decades. And being citizen of nowhere, right? And finally in 2019, I became the citizen of this great country. So this is the greatest achievement that, you know, after like, after two decades, you know, I can now probably say that I'm the citizen of this country. So um, for your question, you know, um, I was r literally a little boy when we were, you know, kicked out of the country. So the reason that we were kicked out of the country was the ethnic cleansing policy that the government brought. Like the government brought one po uh, policy saying that one nation, one people. So there were like different ethnic groups in our country. So we, the Southern Bhutanese, usually the Bhutan government said that we are low sampas. So um, we, 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 we had our own culture, language, and like, you know, several other religions. So uh, we were not allowed to practice those religions. We were not allowed to practice our culture. So they wanted us to follow their religion. They wanted us to follow their culture. So which we didn't think that it was good. And then, you know, some of the, the frontline leaders that they started raising the voice against the government, that that is something that we have the rights. Then, so that was something not good for the government. And then they use even the, the military force and then we were kicked out of the country. And some people, just to save their, save their family, save their, you know, uh, their dignity, and, you know, like, they, they had to flee the country. So once we were displaced out of the country, you know, like, we were in refugee camp. So in the beginning, so we were not entitled with the word so-called refugees. So we were just the, you know, the displaced people from Bhutan. So, uh, like, there was no place for us. The even Indian government, they didn't let us to stay there, which was pretty close to our country, right? So we came to Nepal, and then in Nepal, people, they, the, the volunteers from Nepal, they just volunteered to supply us very little amount of food, and then, like, our roof was the natural sky, and our bay, was the the earth, you know, like so I sometimes when I tell the experience to people, you know, I usually say that. I have the experience of sleeping open in the open sky with the pillow as the rock. And also I have the experience of like you know, staying in a five star hotel, right? So I've gone through all those. So uh yeah, so when we were in the refugee camp, so 
I can I can barely remember, you know, like how the government used to treat us. So, in a refugee camp, so a lot of, lot of young, uh, I'm sorry, the the children and then the elderly population, they died every day. Hundreds of these people were dying at the bank of the river with no proper, you know, supply of medication, no proper nutrition, no proper, you know, shelter. So uh, I think then, you know, like the, the international communities like the UNHCR, mm -hmm. uh, World Food Program, they, they, you know, they stepped up and then they started giving us very basic uh, assistance like food, uh, some medications, and, 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 and to live in a, a little, little hut. They have, they have given the materials to live in the hut, like bamboos, our, our hearts work. So I have a picture of my, the, you know, the hut in my office. So, so we lived in a refugee camp, but thankfully, you know, when people were displaced from our country, even the teachers from my ethnic community were displaced. And then what they did is like they, you know, uh, initiated education system in the refugee camp, but our, our classes were under the tree. So the, the medium of the instruction was on, all in English. That's why I, I can actually speak English. Excuse me. And then, uh, then there was a formal education system in the refugee camp that was initiated by those teachers who, who were displaced uh, from the country. So I think that is one of the reasons that most of the Bhutanese refugees are successful in this country. A lot of them are like entrepreneur. A lot of them are like, you know, the business owners. So, and I think that I'm, I'm, I'm a successful man now, you know, so one of the successful Bhutanese refugees in this country. So, uh, we waited like years and years for the repatriation to go back to their country. There was a bilateral talk between the government of Bhutan and government of Nepal, and that didn't help. And then later we were recognized as a refugee, and then the thought about the third country resettlement was uh, brought up, and uh, you know we decided to come to the United States. So it's a, again a long process. Like I was supposed to come to this country in 2008, but due to like screening, like thorough screening and a lot of process like medicals and all, and all, the, all of this, you know, like it took me for four years to be in this country. So I have applied for the resettlement in this country in 2008, in the beginning of 2008, and then finally I arrived in 2012, so which is like four years. So uh, when, when I came here, then it's totally a new life, a new chapter to begin the life in the United States. So, uh, you know, we were given like $25 each as the, the pocket money when we came here. So my case manager just picked me up from the airport and then, you know, like the, the temperature of the, uh, the weather at the time was, was in October. So I forgot to tell you that yesterday it marked 11th anniversary in this country for myself. So I arrived in this country on October 12th, uh, sorry, October 10th, 2012. So yesterday was my, you know, the arrival date. So yeah, I felt like, you know, great, thank you. So um, the resettlement process in the United States, so I have gone through that. So with $25, there was, the, there was an apartment for me which was made ready by the resettlement agency. Uh, the caseworker who just uh, came to pick me up at the airport was the person from my country. He was a refugee from Bhutan, and then but he was a case manager, so I didn't have any like difficulty, like you know, communicating. And then finally, my sister was here, so I had I was able to reunite my reunite with my sister. So. Then there, after 
the process was a little, you know, like uh, difficult as well as it is, it, it was like, you know, a complete different, complete, completely different. Like there was difference in culture, like cultural shock was there, right? Different in system, the living, the way of living. So I lived in a camp and I've never seen this lights for years. And when I came to the came came to this country, I was in an apartment which is lighted. There was fridge, you know, and then there was like the stove and everything. So which was which was beyond my expectation. So, uh, but you know, we were told in the cultural orientation back in the refugee camp that you know, like the honeymoon period, and then when the honeymoon period goes down. Like then, uh, we have to be self-sufficient. In the process of self-sufficient, like we were given, uh, you know, the cultural orientation, how to adjust in this new community, and uh, also, you know, like how to find job. So, obviously, you know, like in most of these, most of the employees in the United States, they will look for the uh, job history, what kind of job you do, right? So when I was in a camp, once I completed my degree, then bachelor's degree, then I started teaching in a refugee camp as a teacher for about seven to eight years. I was a teacher. And then my experience, so there was, there was an opening in the, the nursery garden where they were looking for the people for the production. And when I went there and then just told them that I never did that job, and I was a, I was a teacher in the refugee camp. So the the owner, the employer told me that you don't fit for this job. So I didn't get job at the the nursery where they uh, grow plants, flowers, and all of these things. So finally, my job developer found me a job of a uh, substitute teacher, and that was like you know. When I when I share this story, when I share my, you know, the achievement that now I'm a I'm a substitute teacher even in the United States. So like that's beyond the man imagination of a lot of people. So people were congratulating me, but you know that didn't help me. I went to several schools in Congress school districts, and the the way of the method, the curriculum of the education system back in refugee camp and here where like the difference of sky and the earth. So that was not, and then that was not the good job for me. And on the other hand, you know, like I had to like pray early in the morning, like get someone sick so that I get job, right? So someone has to be absent so that only I'll be getting that job. So I needed, like I was looking for a consistent kind of job that will help me to pay my bills rent and everything. So then uh, I started working at Walmart. Right after working at the Walmart, you know, like I was also volunteering at the resettlement agency because I thought that they did a lot to me and I should give them back, right? So since I was I was having a good English at the time, they considered that it was I had a good English. And then I volunteered with the resettlement agency for translation for their orientation. I was volunteering to translate them. Even, and then there was a requirement that I had to go to English class. So I would, there was no like match for me. So, you know, like uh, then I started helping the ASO teacher to teach uh, English for the people. Uh, so I was a student as well as I was the helper at in the ESOL class. So then there was opening opening in the resettlement agency for the case manager. And then right after eight months of my arrival, I started working with the refugees as the case manager. So I worked at the, the resettlement agency for almost like nine plus years. And then recently, you know, I just wanted to like switch and no difference, you know, the building community in New Hampshire is also doing the same job, same work, working for the people, for the cause, you know. So, and then then in May, I started working at building community of New Hampshire. So, in the course of my service, 
like I have seen a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of, you know, the difficulties that the people have to face during the time of, you know, the the resettlement. Some people, there are job opportunities, but you know, due to the lack of, uh, you know, the communication, English skills, they were deprived of that job. So, but now you know, like there are a lot, lot of growing um, companies that don't really require the, you know, the English speaking skills. So a lot of our clients are working there. But on the other hand, you know, uh, there are also people that, who seek services, like undocumented people. People, and, and then also, you know, we, 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 we have certain fundings that is restricted. Like we can only serve people within certain period of time, like people within five years of their arrival, refugees, legally, legally you know, like uh, uh, entered into the United States. And also then, you know, like we started serving the, uh, the, the Afghan humanitarian parolees and then later, later you know, the Ukra Ukrainian humanitarian parolees. So there are so many people around, they are still seeking for help, but our hands are tied. So you know, like obviously we have to uh, rely on the the indirect costs. So which obviously we just get from the donation from the kind-hearted people like you and all over here. So um, this is how we are going through. And then you know, this is a very miserable as well as when I feel now it is like it is. I feel like that is is kind of like relieving kind of journey that I have gone through. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, really appreciate it. And I'd, I'd like to turn to Jeff and, and sort of focus back on the, on the policy. Um, can you talk a little bit, Vijay mentioned how there are, there are restrictions on who can be helped, how they can be helped, for how long, how many numbers. We've seen from Obama to Trump back to Biden, uh, wild swings in the number of refugees who, uh, the cap on number of refugees, that doesn't mean we always reach that. Can you talk a little bit about um, just sort of that overall process to give us an idea of numbers of restrictions and, and barriers in place to people achieving the refugee status and resettlement here in the US? Yeah, thank you, uh, and thanks for that story. That's very powerful. Uh, the 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 president of the United States has the authority under the law to set the ceiling on the number of refugees who can come into the country every year. And so, uh, during the Biden administration, President Biden has set that ceiling at 125,000 people, and then it's distributed geographically by different regions of the world. <coughs> the United States has never hit that number in the past uh, several years, and the reason why we haven't hit that number is because uh, the prior administration decimated the whole process by which refugees come to the, pro to the country. So they underfunded uh, the people outside of the United States who are charged with interviewing refugees. Uh, they didn't fund uh, refugee resettlement centers. Uh, they didn't uh, fund the processing centers. Uh, and the USCIS, the US Citizenship and Immigration Services, uh, have been perpetually underfunded. So when the, the new president came in and tried to ramp up the refugee resettlement program, it has taken some time. This year, uh, fiscal year 23, which finished on September 30th, 2023, about 56, 57,000 or so, I don't know the exact number of refugees, were admitted to the United States. Uh, the president has said that the goal is to get to 125,000 refugees in fiscal year 24, which started on October 1st. The Obama administration uh, was generally admitting about 75,000 refugees per year. In President Obama's, in 2016, 85,000 refugees were admitted because the president uh, had a special category for Syrians. His goal was to get 10,000 Syrians into the country, and many Syrians actually came here to New Hampshire. And we resettled a bunch of uh, Syrians uh, who have been very successful, actually, in this, in this area. Uh, <clears throat> then, new president came in. That president, President Trump, uh, didn't look too kindly on this program and tried to uh, take it down any way he could. And so, uh, I realize we're nonpartisan and all we're of that. We're nonpartisan, you guys. <laughs> okay, I'm free to say what I want. So, <laughs> good. So he, uh, he worked very hard, he and his team worked very hard to decimate the refugee resettlement program and to close borders in general, 
which we're now seeing the ramifications of that because there are, there are 11 million job openings in the United States. There's 6 million people seeking those jobs. And had we had a decent immigration system over the past several years, we would have enough workers, maybe, for, some, for those jobs. So the, the outcome, the result of, a, of closed borders is that down the line, a few years down the line, you don't have enough workers. Uh, and you don't have enough people coming to the country to fill jobs that need to be filled. So <clears throat> the Refugee Resettlement Program is, a, as I said, one program. Congress also and the President also have the authority to admit other people to the country uh, in special ways. So in 2021, President Biden, admit, and 2021, 2022, President Biden admitted uh, Afghan uh, humanitarian parolees to the United States. They were given the same benefits as refugees. You asked about ben refugee benefits. Refugees, and I'll explain that in a minute. They were given the same benefits as refugees, but they weren't given a pathway to citizenship. And Senator Shaheen here in New Hampshire and other leaders uh, in the Congress are trying to pass what's called the Afghan Adjustment Act, and that would allow them to become uh, green card holders now, within a year of being in the United States, have been here for longer, and then to get citizens, uh, citizenship within five years. That would, uh, that would make, by the way, uh, economic sense, because agencies like ours are spending thousands of dollars to help people get through the asylum process, help people to get their status adjusted in the United States, and if the, uh, they were admitted as refugees, that wouldn't be the case. So Congress and the President, uh, and this was a special act of Congress, have the power to set up a special status, which they did for Afghans. They did the same thing for Ukrainians. So Ukrainians were admitted as Ukrainian uh, humanitarian parolees. Those categories of folks were, came to the United States with some benefits. Afghans and refugees came with the benefit with some housing support. So agencies like ours, like the International Institute of New England, get a, a, some money from the federal government, it's like about $1,200 uh, for administrative costs and $1,200 uh, that go directly to the refugee. And we use that money for first month's rent, last month's rent, and security deposit. So it's gone very quickly. Manchester, New Hampshire, years ago, was a more affordable place to resettle refugees. And then, you know, 2015, 2016, 2017, we look at our records, and the cost of housing here was, was reasonable. It wasn't cheap, but it was reasonable, and it was available. Well, now, when refugees come to New Hampshire, when we resettle refugee families, Afghans or any other group, we know and my colleague here, Henry Harris, who runs our, our Manchester office can correct me, but we know we're going to need probably two adults in that family to work to bring in enough money to pay for the cost of, of housing and living in general. The subsidy only lasts for a short, you get one, it's one payment. So if it's a family of four, you might have you know, a little under $5,000 that you can use for first month's, last month's, and security deposit, and maybe other expenses that they need. So people have to get a job right away, we have money to help them with job training and job placement. It does not, those contracts that we get from the federal government do not cover all of our costs. The uh, Refugee Resettlement Program, by the way, when it was established in 1980, was established as a public-private partnership. And that's because resettlement in this nation grew out of faith groups and community groups welcoming the stranger, welcoming people to the United States, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, uh, Lutheran Immigrant uh, and Refugee Services. Uh, our organization is called the U.S. Committee for, uh, for uh, Refugees and Immigrants, and it was started uh, out of the YWCA. So we were formed out of a YWCA in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1918, when a group of women in the YWCA said, let's welcome people. This was a period of anti-immigrant sentiment, by the way. But the, the women at this group said, let's welcome people to the United States, make them feel welcome, let's help them feel like they're part of the community. So this has been a public-private partnership forever. And when we meet with uh, State Department and uh, uh, federal government officials, they always remind us of that. This is a public-private partnership. It's not fully funded. Don't complain, they kind of say. Uh, and go to your communities and get resources from the community. So that's why resettlement is always a partnership with the federal government, the state government, which gives us some support, and then the community. And that's, that's something that, that people need to understand. The community has to be involved. And the community is very involved here in New Hampshire. They're involved by fundraising. The community members are involved by helping us set up apartments. Churches uh, help us set up a lot of apartments here in Manchester. Uh, so that's how the whole, the whole system works. 
Refugees are eligible for benefits technically for five years and there's different programs that can help them, but that doesn't mean it should never be seen, by the way, as they're getting a free pass. Every refugee who comes here, we just heard this example, they want to work. Uh, every parolee from Afghanistan, most, most really want to work hard. In Massachusetts now, we have uh, had, I don't know what it is, it comes into the state over 10,500 uh, Haitian parolees. Uh, our agency has enrolled 5,800 Haitian parolees in services. And uh, it's a whole mess to try to get them to their employer authorization documents and get them to work. It messes. It's a messy process and a long process because of the way that the federal government uh, operates and runs things. Um, and you've probably read about the migrant uh, shelter crisis that we have in Massachusetts. So we're involved in that, providing legal services and case management to people in those shelters. And those folks, Haitian parolees are paroled in. They don't have the refugee status. We've advocated for that for them. We've advocated the president, you can just make them refugees if you want to. Um, and then his legal team doesn't, doesn't see it the same way, uh, <clears throat> which, is, which is how government works. But we'd love for them to be refugees because if they were refugees, they would also have a pathway to citizenship. And that is the best way to, to, to stay in the country and uh, get security here. So that's, that's kind of how the process works. And um, it all starts overseas, but it ends up at the local level and it's successful at the local level because folks come together from the community and help out. And that's the most important thing I think to remember here. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate um, the, the insight that the community here in Manchester has been, been helpful, useful, welcoming. Um, but Vijay, I'd love to, to talk to you and, and uh, hear from you about what your first experiences here in the US were like. Were they positive? Uh, were people accepting of you? I know you said that you were able to quickly reconnect with your sister, which was helpful. Um, but sort of after that honeymoon period, uh, what was the experience within the community uh, that you felt? So just before I only told my story, my it wasn't that hard for me to connect to the communities, you know. But uh, but other folks, you know. So they were, they had like, they were all like, I can, I can tell all the refugees that come to the United States or any of the, uh, you know, the hosting countries, they come with trauma. So to get rid of this, it takes time. And a lot of like, uh, so like when you were uh, telling me what was the experience after the honeymoon. After the honeymoon, I knew that, you know, like I have to work, right? And then there were only few people who knew that they have to work. And then there were also people that were not able to work because of several reasons, because of their medical, you know, reasons, because of their, you know, the mental reason, you know, mental status, because they were all like, you know, trauma-informed people, and they, they, they were scared. They had the ability, physically they were able to work, but they were so scared to go and work with the, you know, the different people. Right, so um, I think this is one of the highest in the United States that there will, the suicide rate in Bhutanese, Bhutanese community. It is because right after the honeymoon period, you know, like people had to go through like uh, a lot. In which I can tell you this story that in Bhutan we never paid the rent. We never had to rely on any uh, government assistance. We were never given that. And also, you know, like, uh, I, I hear from my parents, they only used to import, or they only used to buy salt. Because, you know, like, Bhutan is a landlocked country, and the salt was not available. So other than salt, they have, like, you know, land, Use land. They used to grow crops by themselves. They have animals like sheep, and then they used to, you know, uh, have their woven clothes by themselves. And for fire, you know, like that. I have seen that they were, when when Bhutan when they when they started when Bhutan started cleaning the the ethnic community, like I I was probably. Uh, you know, I was in the last fish to leave the country. So I saw that, you know, like everything was blocked. 
like to go to the border or to the the town areas where we used to get food you know so that was all blocked because they wanted they wanted us to leave the country so i have seen people using the rocks to get the light fire you know so bhutan government turned up us to be in the the stone age so that i have experienced so then when people now came here after the honeymoon period like when their reception and placement money has been gone used in the rent the first month rent the security deposit thereafter uh you know like employable people were able to get uh uh, the matching grant program where they used to get like $50 a week for them to, you know, uh, help themselves, right? And people, those who were not employable, they used to get refugee cash assistance, which was not enough for them to pay the rent. Now, you know, the case managers, they have to bring people to the city welfare to, you know, get help for the housing assistance. So people thought that this is an ongoing process. And then they lost hope. And so many people, so many people in front of, you know, like us, like if I have I have witnessed several uh, suicide cases in, in New Hampshire, but across the country, in, across the United States, so a lot of people, they lost their life. Because they, they, they were kicked out of the country without allowing them to take anything else. Like they had their money in the bank. They were not allowed to get those, and nothing else. So you know they had property, they had their house. But as soon as you know, like the people were kicked out of the the, the house, then the military the, the military force came and they burned their house and they demolished their house houses, thinking that these people would come back and stay there. So that was the the harsh treatment treatment to the people. That's why people fled, right? So uh, after the honeymoon per period, it was a disaster. So people lost their life, and then you know, a lot of people are still now in the recovery stage. You know, like they are regaining their, you know, uh, wellness. I can say, you know, and there are only like few people those are successful, but people with disability, people. Uh, we, elderly people, they are still in misery. So they are still having a painful life in this country. So th there are so many resources. I know that, but those people, they they cannot reach out to those the resources, help, assistance. So so that you know, like the the agency, like the International Institute, Building Community of New Hampshire, his century are vital to connect these people with the, the community and serve them. Well, I think uh, we'll take a moment just to make the, the PSA announcement that uh, if anyone is in need of services, there is the, the 988 number uh, nationwide now. So uh, please do reach out to that if, if you are in need of any help. If they don't ask your your status here in the country or anything of that nature. Um, so, so please do utilize that resource. Um, I, I have one more question for Jeff before we open it up to audience questions, both in person and online. Um, so if you have a question online, put it in the chat now uh, so we can be sure to get to as many as we can. But Jeff, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the recent addition to refugee resettlement, the community resettlement teams. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that program looks like? I know a number of people, both here in the room and uh, some of our former board members, hi, Diane, um, have, have done that uh, for uh, mainly Afghans here in New Hampshire, but uh, any, anyone can get involved. Can you talk about what that looks like? Yeah, so the United States government has set up a program called Welcome Corps in which people can sponsor uh, refugees and you can you know, come together with some of your resources. You have to make a financial commitment, you have to commit time, uh, and you can welcome refugees and they can be assigned to you. Also, agencies like ours, we have a community sponsorship program. This is a community sponsorship program in which people work under the direction and with the support of a trained case manager. And so you're getting uh, guidance and advice as you're doing this work. 
uh, it works just like Welcome Corps, except, and there are financial commitments and all that, except you don't have all the obligations. We find the housing, uh, we provide uh, the case management support, but we rely on that team, that community sponsorship team, to take people to medical appointments, to take p kids to school, uh, to help people prepare for job interviews, uh, to kind of take people uh, and handle different emergency situations that might come up. So the U.S. government is seeing the Welcome Port Corps program as a way uh, to bring uh, more refugees to the United States. Uh, again, this is an example of the, of the historic uh, program of, as a, as a public-private partnership. We're excited about it. We also know, uh, as Vijay was saying, you know, the key to success for a newly arrived refugee, actually any new newly arrived uh, early status immigrant with limited resources, parolees and refugees, is that they get off to a strong start in this country. So if they get some help, uh, if they get some help in finding a job, if they get extra support in meeting their housing needs, if they get support from a family or a church group or a community of neighbors coming together to support them, chances are very good they're gonna integrate faster. So we've seen with our own community sponsorship program that those who have had the help of a community sponsorship team have actually integrated faster into the community. Uh, they've gotten jobs faster, they've advanced a little bit faster economically, uh, so it's a way for community members to come together and uh, support newcomers. It's an exciting program. We urge people to do it. There are different ways out there, different models. Accenture has uh, neighborhood support teams. We have a community sponsorship uh, program called Resettle Together, in which you work with uh, some of our staff. Uh, but there are lots of programs out there, several different programs out there, and we encourage people to get involved. It's a great way to get involved in resettlement. Also, it's a good, uh, it's good politically because uh, friends and neighbors uh, say to their elected members of Congress and uh, others that, hey, I've got refugees in the community and we're working with that group and they're great people and that helps to support the program generally around the country. All right, I'll turn it over to the, the audience. We only have one microphone here tonight, so uh, please bear with us. Uh, we do want people to use it so that uh, we get good audio online. Uh, but. I'll, I'm watching on here. I have a couple of uh, questions in the queue on our email, uh, but if anyone in the audience wants to start. Oh, okay. And please introduce yourself so that uh, we know who you are. Good evening, sir. I, I'm sorry we arrived late and I don't have the name straight, so I apologize for that, but I, I'm, I'm Tom Lurie. I live here in Manchester, and my wife and I have been involved with the with the immigration community for some decades now. But I'm curious. Uh, I have a kind of a higher level question. If I'm sitting in Washington or wherever this occurs, and I'm looking at a pool of say 100 refugees that are coming in, I've got 25 from South Sudan. I've got 25 from Nigeria. I've got 25 from Eastern Europe, and I've got 25 from Syria. How does the allocation process work to communities, and is there any sensitivity to what the needs of those communities are so that those people have a better chance of succeeding? Yes, so there, there is sensitivity. There's, um, the, all of the resettlement agencies have to uh, submit uh, abstracts every year to our national offices and uh, explain the level of community support we have. And then we put in that, that information um, some of the parameters that we, we, we need to have met in order for resettlement to be successful. So we say things like there needs to be you know, at least two adults in the family who can work for, them to, to, for, the, for the program to work financially, for them to be successful financially in a new community. Um, we report on you know, school resources, community partners, relationships that we have with hospitals and healthcare. We have a lot of conversations about the number of refugees we can take. We have a dialogue with the state refugee coordinator here in New Hampshire. Um, we, uh, you know, our staff goes back and forth. Our managing director in, Man in Manchester makes a pitch for his number. So we, we kind of come together on the number and we try to be re very realistic about uh, who we can accept. At the national level, there is an allocation process um, and, the, and the nine or now 10 national organizations like the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, they have an allocation. They're allocated a certain number of refugees. 
and they go into their networks and then they, they make determinations in part in conversation with agencies like us about who should go where. So if there's a US tie, so if there's a Bhutanese family or if there's a, someone with a, uh, you know, ties to a certain community or there's someone with a, with a tie to a neighbor or a friend that they knew in the refugee camp, they try to put them, the uh, US government tries to put them uh, with, in close to a fam family and friends because that's more support for them. Um, and, you know, we have said things, for example, in Boston, this was working, although the landlords have kind of changed their tune because of the market, because we were, we were allowed to put um, two, fo two, two people, uh, we were able to take a two-bedroom apartment, put four, four young men in there a lot of times. And so we said to our national network, we'll take single cases and we'll put them in apartments in greater Boston and uh, we'll, be the, we'll be the one place around the country, one of the few places around the country that will take singles, mostly, mostly single men. Because they, you know, single, that, that was a great uh, program. And then, you know, now the landlords in, our, in, our, in Boston anyway have gotten more difficult about this. They're not, they want one person per bedroom. They want people to pay a lot more money. Uh, so we're trying to figure out the new reality. But what we say is, this is what's required to be successful in New Hampshire. And we try to get that with the folks that come here. And, um, you know, every case is a little different. Thank you. Yep. And just to follow on that, um, is there any consideration given to, like, so New Hampshire and, and many places around the country have a health care shortage? Um, can you guys look for people who have health care backgrounds, understanding that they need additional training and certification and all of that kind of stuff? or? Uh, you know, maybe outside of the healthcare industry, uh, you know, workers in, in a specific industry that might be able to, to recruit from. Yeah, every, everybody wants healthcare workers when, uh, <clears throat> you know, you talked about my prior, my prior move, I worked in the Christian Ray schools, this is a school where high school students worked to earn their tuition, so my job was to try to get myself in front of human resources directors and CEOs and CEO, CEOs to get jobs for kids. So without naming the person's name, this one fellow who dodged me for a long time, now is the head of a, has a senior position in human resources at a hospital in, in New Hampshire. So we were in the news for all the Afghans coming and he, he got in front of me, he was trying to get in front of me to, to, to get jobs for, to, you know, to, to employ people in his hospital. Um, it doesn't always work that simply, you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't. Um, you know, folks come in, they have varying level, various levels of English, they may have a healthcare background. We have a certified, we have a, a licensed nursing assistance program here in Manchester in partnership with Manchester Community College. It's training people, mo mostly women sign up for the program. They have varied backgrounds. Some have healthcare uh, in their history, their work history, some do not. But we have that program, it's, it, it fills up fast and we're placing people very quickly in the workforce and there's not enough licensed, licensed nursing assistants, not enough LNAs in the state. So yeah, the state needs healthcare workers. But again, that gets back to the larger problem, a much, much, more, a much bigger problem, which is, one, we should have been letting in more pe people into the country in the first place over the past several years. Two, we have to make sure that housing is affordable, which requires more of a subsidy from state and local and federal government. And, and, and it really does, because if you give that subsidy, they're more likely to get a job and stay in a job, which is better for the overall economy. And they'll eventually pay back that subsidy by making money, paying into the tax system. So, um, <clears throat> and you know, in some cases, we also need more English classes for folks, because a lot of the people that are in the programs have limited English skills. And the, the more English we have, the more opportunities they have. And we have, I don't know, 15 English classes going on at our office here in Manchester at uh, Brookside Church. So, you know, <clears throat> but if we have more money, we can offer more English classes. More people can get trained faster. They can get in the workforce. So again, it gets back to that whole theme, which is the, the, the more resources you give in the beginning, the faster an immigrant or a refugee starts in the economy, the better it is for everybody. Everybody benefits. Hi, I, I'm Bill DeVries again. Um, could you straighten out for me something that I, I've, I've always never quite understood? Um, I understand, you know, you come in, a refugee comes into the country um, and he has to wait a, a year for a green card, but he can't work without a green, green card, no, or? He can. he can. Oh, he can. Okay, so that, that's, I guess, what I, what I misunderstood. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's the uh, the asylees who have trouble around uh, immediate work, and and their cases can take forever. And Shameless Plug will be talking about that uh, next month. Um, so 
go on our website and sign up for our next conversation. Um, okay, so we have a question online uh, from Steve, and he uh, has basically asked, uh, paraphrasing here, of course, uh, we're careening towards another government shutdown, potentially. We, we came minutes or hours away from uh, one a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and I know from talking to, to Rick a, a few weeks ago as well that that has a real impact to government shutdown uh, and government funding issues on the resettlement process. Um, can both of you talk a little bit about what that has looked like to your your organizations and why it's important for the government to you know do its one job and create a budget? Vijay, we'll start with you. Yeah. So as soon as we heard that. Uh, you know, right after the government said there was a uh, possibility, you know. So we got the information from the state that any Ukrainian arriving into this country on October 1st and after that, they are not eligible for the, uh, the refugee support services that uh, the grant that we got. So that created another kind of like, uh, you know, the problem in the, the Ukrainian community. Like their family members are still there. But a good thing about that is, you know, like, uh, the positive part of that is if the family members are here and the family members are joining after, after the October 1st, 2021, so they will be eligible for the services, but a lot of people coming after that day, they are not eligible for any of these state benefits, So, which is one of the main problems that we are facing. So, But we, are, we haven't shut the door for them to get the services, like we have the unrestricted uh, funding. So, you know, again, that uh, we have to rely on those uh, uh, funding. So, uh, so far, we have only got like two Ukrainians uh, that approached to us for the help, and then we are still serving them. Yeah, so I mean, a government shutdown delays the flow of money to organizations like ours, and it can delay checks, refugee cash assistance checks that go to certain clients. Uh, as VJ was saying, Ukrainians were not in the continuing resolution, so there's no benefits for them after the 1st of uh, October. Uh, so uh, if there's a shutdown in 40, whatever it is, two or 41 days, if that happens, again, checks won't come. Refugee cash assistance checks, which people need, those checks don't come to you and you don't have money coming in and uh, you're eligible for that. That's uh, not, the landlord won't be paid. You won't be able to pay for your food. Uh, it, it, it's, it has a ripple effect on, on the entire economy. It isn't good for anybody. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we will not be shutting down services. We'll still have staff working. Uh, it also uh, slows down the flow of money from the federal government because they've got a, there's a process in which federal money goes to the states and that state money then comes to us. So it's, it, is, uh, it is not a good thing. We won't be, you know, we, we will keep working. We're not going to lay anyone off during, a, during this period of time. But in terms of money coming to people who need it, it won't happen. A truck. <laughs> Jack Rush, a member of the board of the World Affairs Council. Uh, <clears throat> when refugees are mentioned in Manchester or other New Hampshire cities, one of the comments that comes up right away is they cost the community money. And, they, and as a result <laughs> of that, we should get rid of the re refugees. What's your answer to that kind of argument that refugees are really a drain on the local economy? And actually, that ties nicely with a, a comment uh, online of uh, why should we bring these people to our country? There are a lot of Americans who could use the $2,400 per person that we are giving away to these people. Well, well Americans who would want the $2,400 would not want to spend two decades in a refugee camp. So, <laughs> um, you know, that that's an, that's just that that's a, not a helpful comment <laughs> so i i would say this is that first of all ref, first of all the united states of america needs people right we have 41,000 job openings or something like that in the state of new hampshire we have an aging workforce in this state so we need people to come in uh, the fact of the matter is that refugees do cost some money up front 
They do. Uh, they are taking more out of the system than they're putting into it in the first few years in the country. But within 20 years of being in the United States, they're actually paying more into the system than a native-born native -born person does uh, on a per capita basis. That's a fact. That's been researched. Notre Dame did a research study on this. So eventually, they're going to pay, pay back more into the system, and then their kids are going to pay back more. And most, uh, uh, you know, the, the leading entrepreneurs in this nation, the people who have set up the largest businesses and the most successful businesses actually were born outside of this country, in, in the Boston area. The, 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 the high-tech companies, Moderna is headed by a Frenchman, Stefan Bancel. Uh, Vertex, big pharmaceutical company, headed by someone from India, uh, Reish Michele Romani. The head of uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb is from Italy, Giovanni Caforio. The head of uh, 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 Pfizer, Albert Borla, is from Greece. So a lot of the successful people in this country, a lot of the people have set up, set up great businesses were once refugees and immigrants. So that investment, the $2,400, um, I think it'd be great to give that uh, fellow $2,400 as long as he would give back at the same level of a refugee or an immigrant. Would create a business, would create jobs, would build the economy the way folks like VJ and others have done. So that's the, the answer is these folks will give back, they will put money back into, they will build our tax base, they will put money back into their economy and then look out for their kids because their kids are going to go far too. Jay, any, any on that? Sorry. Yeah, so, so more or less Jeff already answered. And in addition to this, I also like to tell you that most of the employable people uh, are, you know, having like more than two jobs. There are so many jobs. Like I have seen um, in New Hampshire, like, uh, Home health care, people with disability, the direct support services they need it. So a lot of refugees are, you know, taking care of these people. And I would also tell you that, you know, like I am one of the example. Like I work seven days a week. I have two full time jobs. One is building community, of, mini building community in New Hampshire. I work Monday through Friday, and in the weekends I work in another agency. That is community of bridges where I support people with disability. So uh, this is something not only me doing. A lot of refugees, they are having this. They are having like at least two jobs. So obviously, you know, like uh, I think that uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, helping to generate the to uplift the economy of the country. So that is my belief. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, last question. Well, I just wanted to add to that. Oh, sure. You know, the perception might be these are all low wage jobs. Well, starting wages now for unskilled, not refugees, without much English, is nineteen twenty dollars an hour. It's not a lot in New Hampshire these days, but it's it's not what people expect. And I have calls from many companies leading manufacturing companies in relatively small communities around here who want 50 people so they can start a second shift, so they can keep the business going, so they can keep the whole town going. They call us, I don't have 50 people who need work right now. But that's, the city of Keene wants to become a resettlement community to keep their, the whole operation going. So it, it really is, as Jeff has said, a powerful economic driver for our continued growth here in New Hampshire, um, as well as all the social benefits that it brings. Okay, last question in the back here. Neil Valentino, I say, um, what's the point of having a mission statement written on the tablet of the Statue of Liberty if we don't fulfill that mission. It's just that simple to me. Yeah. Well, I'll give you guys a, a chance to respond to that, but also, um, what is the a, a good way to close it out here? What's the one big thing, small thing that people can do that would be most helpful to uh, meeting that mission uh, that, that Neil has uh, elaborated on? You know, I think the most important thing is that the community and individuals in the community welcome newcomers and say, we need people here. I think the, your, your voice uh, to legislators, your voice in the community, being the person who stands up and says, 
We need newcomers in our, in our community. We need refugees here. We need immigrants here. We need to make Manchester and New Hampshire uh, a welcoming place for all. We need to find a way to find people homes here. If you think like that, and you also think that you know bringing people here is good for all of us, it's good for the people who come, and it's good for those who were fortunate enough to be born in this country, and fortunate enough to be born in New England, uh, I think if you can do that and say that, and maybe contribute a little time and a little money, you will, you will change uh, the community for the better. And this is already, by the way, I mean, I see every time, I, this is a welcoming community. I think that, that Manchester and New Hampshire in general is full of very generous, good-hearted people. There are some people who are loud online, who send comments and emails and letters that are not always so nice, but uh, by and large, people are very welcoming. Yeah, so I have also experienced that people in New Hampshire, they were welcoming, you know, like, uh, when people are wandering around, if people of color, color wandering around, I have seen people like stepping in and helping them, you know, so that makes me feel that, you know, that we are welcomed. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us uh, here tonight, as well as to the people watching online, the recording. We really appreciate your interest in this conversation. As I said earlier, we hope this is the start of a conversation and something that you'll continue to think about and discuss uh, and, and share some of the great insights that uh, Jeff and Vijay have, have shared with us here tonight. So uh, please join me in thanking both Jeff and Vijay for And we look forward to seeing you all again uh, on November 6th. Uh, if you are uh, available, we'd love to, to see you to uh, finish out the third in our T. William and Patricia Ayers Global Tipping Point series this fall. Thank you so much. Thank you.